Uh, hello, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. And welcome to the panel of Smart Cities. Uh, we will talk in uh, Spanish and English to diversify a little bit. Um, tenemos aquí a tres maravillosos panelistas. Los tres son arquitectos. Van a hacer una intervención de diez minutos cada uno. Y voy a proceder a presentar al primero, que es Johnny Baboki. Él es arquitecto, proyectista y un, entusiasma, un, entusiasta, eh, un versátil entusiasta urbano. Actualmente trabaja como director general de planificación y desarrollo urbano en el municipio de Tirana, en el que lidera un equipo de más de 100 arquitectos, eh, proyectistas e ingenieros. Tiene experiencia en el sector privado, grandes éxitos en concursos internacionales y ha liderado durante varios años una innovadora startup para el gobierno albanés llamada Atelier Tirana, centrada en promover el desarrollo urbano mediante el diseño. Es un apasionado del diseño sostenible y de las ciudades inclusivas y recientemente escribió un interesante artículo llamado Diseñar para niños debe ser el plan A. ¿Por qué no lo hacemos? And now I give the floor to Johnny Baboki. Thank you. Thank you so much. That sounds much better in Spanish, I guess. Uh, hello everyone and thank you so much for being here at this time. Uh, we understand we are here the barrier, the last barrier between you and drinks. So we'll try to get this done fast and also maybe give you a, a, a small idea about uh, smart cities or, or how we understand smart cities. I think it's a very different gamut and range of options. So I'm going to talk about Tirana. It's uh, the capital of Albania. I'm going to try to hopefully find what full screen means in Spanish. What do you need? Yeah, can you move, make it full yes. screen? Uh, All right, this just control that. Perfect. Thank you so much. So my name is Yoni. I, I was already introduced. I'll just move forward. Tirana is the city, the capital of Albania. It used to be a very, very small city until 30 years ago. Uh, it was a city of 200,000, as you can see in the map. This photo is made in 1989, and then this in 1999, this 2009, and then this is this year. So clearly you can see the growth and the sprawl that the city had in the last 30 years. You can see the, 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 all the agricultural and natural land that was consumed mostly by informal development without any sort of plan. So people just built their own homes. It was a great opportunity. It was some, for some of them it was the first time they were visiting the capital of the country because during communism this was much more controlled. But it also created a, whole, a lot of problems for us trying to plan backwards in a way after the fact. So currently there's one million people in Tirana, in a country of 2.8 million, so basically we're more than one-third of the whole country. Uh, we like to call ourselves the Plan B for Albanians. A lot of Albanians want to come to Madrid or to Berlin uh, or to the UK, and their Plan B, of course, is come to Tirana. So while the, the country is actually shrinking, the city is growing every year. So it's a very interesting and very sort of special, uh, I think, uh, situation. Five years ago we started working for the city of Tirana, uh, and one of our first priorities was the kindergartens. They were in very, very horrible conditions. And the concept was, can we get this done in two months? Can we call on the private sector, come to us, help us, adopt a kindergarten? And we were able to just, in just in two months, all the kindergartens in Tirana were really, really different than before. And that sort of provided one of the first impetus of how we can actually try and change these cities and create a city which is much more friendlier to children. The concept is that often people who don't vote, Children, especially children, are not really taken account into politics, especially local government. So it's mostly parents, it's mostly maybe young people who can have a right to vote, uh, maybe uh, older people. Children are never part of the equation, so we try to change that equation a bit around. We try to have a lot of public art and local art wherever uh, under 95 centimeters, which is the typical height of a, of a three-year-old child. Uh, we also intervened a lot in neighborhoods. The concept was, can we transform these areas into social areas where it's much more inclusive? So not a space to park cars or empty spaces, but a space for playgrounds, for family gatherings, and sort of bring back a sort of idea of community. Uh, we have 48 of those, one a month for the first four years that we work, and now we have a new project which I'll talk a bit about at the end. So yeah, the concept was, how can we transform not just the infrastructure, but also the social structure of those neighborhoods? Uh, and then I think one of the keystone projects to explain Tirana was the square. Our central square, again, in 1989, you can see there's no cars. We had 200 cars total in the city of Tirana, all of them driven by the political cater, so the, the, the big shots of the Communist Party. And you can see people walking everywhere. And then slowly and informally, 10 years later, you see some cars popping up. You also see this area being sort of cordoned off informally and becoming some sort of a roundabout. And then five years ago, what we found out was this. 
an actual roundabout for cars in the center of the city. So the city wasn't a destination. It was a, the center of the city was a transit. You would just go through it. You would come, go around, and then leave. So the project we implemented was very, very strong in terms of transforming all of it into a huge pedestrian space with 11 different gardens around and trying to sort of transform it into the, the living room of all of Albania. Uh, it was very, very controversial, of course. Uh, lots of people uh, talking. The idea here was, again, how can we sort of implant a small revolutionary in every family. How can we use children to our advantage and to the, to the advantage of the city in a way? Uh, you know, we did the same thing with plastic bags. Uh, we told the mayor would go around in schools and explain how bad plastic bags are for the environment and for, for, for using them. And then they would go back home and then they would sort of tell their parents, what are you doing? You can't throw the plastic bag, you have to recycle it. So therefore you had this, this small, again, ideological revolutionary trying to change the way that the family unit worked. Uh, and it's something usually that people don't pay very much attention to. So it's a, it's a fantastic space in the center of Tirana. And of course, now we have car-free days which are less controversial and with much more people going outside. I'll skip some of the slides. Uh, so we're, we're building 17 new schools as community centers in the city of Tirana. Uh, the idea is that the schools, uh, again, going back to the idea of what a smart city is, it doesn't always have to be technological. Uh, these schools are being designed from the ground up as cathedrals, sort of our big, small Sagrada Familias for education for the younger generation. Uh, the concept there is that they can, use, they can be used for schools up to a certain time, at 1, 2 p.m., and then they can transition into being uh, social spaces for the community. We had some fantastic discussions here today, and one of the most ideas that you hear all the time is how can we generate change? How can we make people uh, change their approach to things? Uh, we often say, when you, whenever you ask people, do you want change? I was, yes, we want change. You ask people, do you want to change? And that's a bit different, like, I'll change, but you change first, because I'm a bit different than other people. So the concept here again is, if we want to generate change, one of the things that we have found out is that change, and there was just a fantastic article at The Economist a couple of weeks ago, change happens generationally. So generations change much faster than individuals. So it's, of course, you can try to get a person who has driven a car for 30 years to not drive a car anymore, but probably you'll have much more success if you focus on a younger generation, so that the, when they grow up, they wouldn't be drivers. And the same thing is valid, of course, for all the other themes that we talked a bit about today here. Uh, I will move very briefly into, again, the tech space. Uh, we moved from the 48 playgrounds to an idea of having a neighborhood network, which is centered on schools, uh, new schools, but also existing schools. And then how could we transform these neighborhoods with a 300-meter radius into an infant, toddler, and caregiver-friendly neighborhoods? So places where uh, families, mothers mostly, but also fathers, could have a, a nicer time with their kid, with their younger kid. Uh, of course, if you look at how, uh, how caregivers move around the city, usually mothers again, it's a much more complex set of movements than a typical adult has. A typical adult goes to work, maybe goes to the shop, and then goes home. Uh, but a caregiver has much more destinations that he has to go through. And therefore, we were trying to, through workshops, do this, uh, how can we change this, and how can we sort of revolutionize, in a way, the way that these neighborhoods work. So we designed a couple of guidelines, uh, of course, approved by council, so they would be sort of uh, binding to implement. And then the thing was, how do we measure our success? How do we know that what we are doing is having uh, sort of an impact? So with, in a fairly complex collaboration <coughs> with Harvard University, with Bernard Van Lier Foundation, and Urban 95, again, a, a fantastic movement uh, dealing with kids and children under 95 centimeters, uh, we designed 10 important objectives. So here's what we want each neighborhood to feel like, in simple words. The most important, I think, or one of the most interesting ones, is breathing clean air. Uh, if you will just breathe with me for just one second. If you're a three-year-old, if you're a one-year-old, so just imagine the air that you're breathing every day. The lower you are in the city, the smaller you are, the more fumes from cars you are breathing. So the more your stunting growth, these are two brain scans, the one on the bottom, it's one that represents stunted growth, it represents the number of connections in an MRI, the one on the top is the one that hasn't had these problems, these issues. So this, we are doing this to our children today, with what we're doing out there. And I think it's, a, it's the idea was how can we again measure the impact that our projects were having. So we had uh, eight people working for a couple of months uh, throughout the city, uh, we had a set of 48 different indicators. So for each neighborhood, we would go out and we would sort of try to measure in a simple way. So it wasn't very complicated with numbers. For most things, it was just three things. Is children in, for example, uh, I'll just take an example of uh, the, the... 
the, how, do, how, how safe do, do children feel in their neighborhoods or caregivers? Are they striving? Are they surviving or are they thriving? See, these were sort of the three uh, uh, indicators that we would use, just three levels, simple. And then we would sort of get all these 48 indicators together and see how each of the neighborhoods, each of 100 neighbors was looking in sort of a in table. And then every time we, would, we now are implementing a project, we go back to the neighborhood, we remeasure, we do, redo the sort of the questionnaire, and then we see the impact that that project has had on the city. And so slowly, uh, we can actually measure our performance in terms of creating a much more infant, toddler, and uh, caregiver-friendly city. I will end with uh, the pyramid. This used to be the uh, mausoleum of the dictator. So when he died, he wanted to be buried here. Of course, it's a pyramid. And interestingly enough, this is how it looks today. So it served this function for two years, and then it has been a NATO headquarters, it has been a, a fair place, jazz festival, book fairs, everything. So we are now transforming it into, again, a space for kids, for a young generation to learn ITC skills. And when I say ITC this time, I don't say infant toddler caregiver, I say internet technology and communications. So the concept here is how can they learn media, how can they learn design, how can they learn programming at a young age before they go to university, so therefore they can then use those skills and they are much more prepared uh, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Urbanística se graduó en Alemania en la Technical University Darmstadt. Ha desarrolló gran parte de su carrera en estudios internacionales y en proyectos de arquitectura y urbanismo a gran escala como la Torre Lidenhall en Londres y la T4 del aeropuerto de Madrid-Barajas. Tras ello, cambió su foco y se empezó a interesar por proyectos de impacto social, eh, pasando de la arquitectura a las infraestructuras. Eh, recibió el apoyo de diversas organizaciones, entre ellas la Fundación Leonardo DiCaprio y la co coalición R20 de Regiones para la Acción Climática, y llevó a cabo proyectos de reagrupación territorial, abastecimiento de agua, regeneración del suelo y proyectos de mitigación del cambio climático, en Asia, África y América. Tras ello, se centró en infraestructuras rentables eh, de gestión de, residuo, de residuos y energía con el objetivo de utilizar esos beneficios para financiar estructuras no tan rentables, pero de interés público. Todo ese expertise la llevó finalmente a fundar, junto con otros dos socios, la compañía Frontline Waste, que promueve la gestión responsable de residuos sólidos y trabaja con municipios en estrategias de vertido cero, que no solo revalorizan los descartes del reciclaje y generan energía limpia, sino que también reducen emisiones y regeneran antiguas áreas de vertidos. Tienes la palabra. Te lo preparo. En estos, en, en estos diez minutos, dar una visión global de cuáles son los mayores problemas de los, de los principales problemas que tiene la basura, cuáles son, cómo lo estamos gestionando ahora. Básicamente, la basura, la basura aparte de contribuir al destrozo del medio ambiente, como sabemos, también contribuye a la, al cambio climático y contribuye porque la, la basura en los vertederos, cuando se descompone, genera gases de efecto invernadero que son los que. Los, 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 que, los que crean el cambio eh, climático, aunque la basura en sí contribuya solo al 5... Ah. Ah, vale. Vale, muchas gracias. Eh, aunque la basura contribuya solo al 5... Por, las emisiones de la basura contribuyan solo al 5% del total de las emisiones, eh, eh, el problema es un poquitín, o sea, los gases que emiten la descomposición de basura son del tipo de los más potentes. Eh, eh, hay varios gases de efecto invernadero, ¿no? eh, la mayor parte de ellos son el dióxido de carbono y el metano. Eh, por su peso, tenemos, por cada tonelada de metano que hay, tenemos cinco toneladas de dióxido de carbono, pero resulta que la capacidad del metano de calentar el medio ambiente es cinco veces superior a la del dióxido de carbono. Por lo tanto, la lectura, el metano, eh, 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 la influencia del metano en el calentamiento global es cinco veces superior a la del dióxido de carbono. ¿Y de dónde proviene el metano? Eh, 
prácticamente las mayores emisiones del metano viene de la agricultura animal, pero la basura contribuye en un 25% a las emisiones de metano. Por lo tanto, tenemos que la la las emisiones que vienen de la basura, en el fondo, contribuyen bastante al calentamiento urbano, mucho más que ese 5% si lo midiéramos por, eh, por peso. Otro aspecto, otro aspecto importante del problema relacionado con la basura del que oímos poco es que causa inundaciones, porque la basura que no recolectamos acaba, acaba bloqueando las, las, uh, los desagües y bloquea también las, las zonas naturales que tienen los ríos para absorber agua, por lo tanto, potencia las inundaciones. Luego, el problema que tenemos con la basura en los mares, yo creo que estamos ya más familiarizados con ellos, los plásticos, sobre todo, tienen efectos mortales en los animales a través de la, cuando lo ingieren o cuando se quedan atrapados en, en, en ello. Y, y la pregunta aquí que surge es, es, si tenemos gestión de residuos, ¿cómo es posible que, todos, que toda esta basura acabe en el, en el medio ambiente? Y un, una explicación es que no toda la basura que emitimos, que generamos, se, se, se gestiona. Una tercera parte de la basura del mundo eh, se queda sin gestionar, es decir, sería el equivalente si nosotros sacamos la basura, la dejamos en la calle y se quedara allí. Eso aplica a una tercera parte de la basura del mundo. Y luego la gestión de residuos eh, eh, es más o menos sofisticada. Tenemos desde la gestión muy básica hasta la gestión prácticamente de vertedero cero. Empezaríamos una gestión básica, sería pues, un vertedero, ¿no? que el vertedero, como ya hemos dicho, genera gases de efecto invernadero y luego también lixiviados que van, a la, que van al subsuelo y contaminan, contaminan las aguas. El siguiente paso sería introducir reciclaje. El recicl con el reciclaje reducimos la fracción que va a vertedero. Lo siguiente, el siguiente paso sería mejorar los vertederos y hacer convertirlos en rellenos sanitarios, que esto lo que significa es que se, pone, eh, se crean unas barreras para contener los lixiviados y luego se recupera el metano, que se genera, aparte de, ser, de, de, de ponerlos en sitios ya eh, eh, controlados. Luego el siguiente paso sería introducir la valorización energética. Esto significa que los residuos, los restos del, del reciclaje, eh, a través de un proceso térmico se convierten en, en calor, ese calor genera vapor, ese vapor mueve unas turbinas y creamos, y creamos electricidad. La valorización energética lo que está haciendo es que, el re, es, es que lo que acaba en vertedero se reduzca todavía más y gracias a la valorización energética hay países que han conseguido lo que llamamos el, el vertido cero, que es lo que, lo que en el fondo nos, nos interesa. Luego el siguiente paso sería el reciclaje 100%, que es lo que la, la economía circular aboga y lo que en el fondo lo que, lo que, lo que, donde queremos llegar. Pero... Uh, ¿Qué pasa? No todos los, solo hay dos países que hayan llegado. Bueno, al reciclaje 100% todavía no hemos llegado. Esto es una lista de, los, de cómo generan, de cómo, de cómo gestionan los distintos países la basura. Las rayas verticales significa el 100% de basura por país, el color gris significa reciclaje, el verde es valorización energética y el amarillo es vertedero. Entonces vemos en, en, en el lado izquierdo que hay dos países que tienen cero residuo, mandan cero residuos a vertedero, que son Suiza y Suecia, y lo han conseguido a través de una combinación de reciclaje y, y valorización energética. ¿Qué nos dice este, este gráfico? Pues uno, que ningún país ha conseguido gestionar sus residuos gracias a 100% reciclaje, que aunque estamos muy lejos de ello, solo se ha conseguido a la mitad, y que la valorización energética y el reciclaje no se excluyen mutuamente, que, se puede tener, que el tener valorización energética no hace que no reciclemos, sino lo contrario, los que más usan la valorización energética son los países que más reciclan. Entonces, ahora la pregunta surge, ¿por qué no tenemos más valorización energética?, esto sería, esto sería una planta que se acaba de inaugurar ahora de valorización energética en, en Copenhague, que sea eh, la planta también en la parte de arriba es una, es una pista de esquí, se ha combinado un centro deportivo con una planta de valorización energética. 
El problema es que estas plantas se hacen hoy en día solo a gran escala, cuestan mucho dinero y solo las ciudades grandes se lo pueden permitir. Por lo tanto, las ciudades pequeñas y medias a día de hoy no tienen una manera de eliminar el vertedero, porque hasta que no llegue el reciclaje 100%, estas ciudades pequeñas van a seguir teniendo el vertedero con lo que eso conlleva, es decir, siguiendo, siguen emitiendo, emitiendo eh, eh, metano. Eh, y aquí viene un poquitín a lo que nos, eh, a los que nos dedicamos en Frontline Ways, lo que estamos haciendo es, es, es buscamos y desarrollamos tecnologías a pequeña escala eh, y, y con costes eh, reducidos que las pequeñas y medianas ciudades puedan utilizar para eliminar vertederos mientras llega el 100% en reciclaje. Somos conscientes que esta es una, es una tecnología puente, porque es una tecnología que va a existir mientras encontremos algo mejor, ¿no? pero de momento es, es, va a ser necesaria si queremos avanzar en, en, en la eliminación de vertederos y en, y en, y en el, eliminar todas estas, todos los gases de efecto invernadero que vienen de la descomposición de la basura. Eh, esto es todo lo que tengo que decir de, de los aspectos. Y por último, os vamos a presentar a Inés, Inés Sánchez de Madariaga. Es también arquitecta, es una reconocida experta internacional en materia de género, en urbanismo, arquitectura, investigación e innovación. Es directora de la Cátedra UNESCO de Políticas de Igualdad de Género, en Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación y profesora titular de Urbanismo y Ordenación del Territorio en la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. Ha sido profesora visitante en, en Columbia University en Nueva York, en la London School of Economics, y Jean Monet Visiting Professor en la Escuela de Arquitectura Bauhaus Weimar. Ha formado y forma parte de numerosos grupos de expertos internacionales, el Consejo Asesor de la Red Española para el Desarrollo Sostenible de Naciones Unidas, el Advisory Group of Gender Issues, el Comité de Expertos en Género de ONU Habitat para la Nueva Agenda Urbana. Es también presidenta de la Asociación de Mujeres Arquitectas de España. Bienvenida. Ah, vale, pues vamos a ver aquí. Aquí está, aquí está. Ah, vale. ¿Está? Aquí. Está, vale. Y la vamos a ver. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether to speak Spanish or English. What would you prefer? Uh, español? English? English? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to give you small, uh, a very short overview of um, how women use cities differently, live cities differently than men, what this implies for planning, um, and um, some of the things that we are doing and that are being doing in Spain and in other countries to approach planning in ways that better responds to the daily needs of lives of, of people in their diversity, and particularly of women and the persons uh, that um, are in one or another way dependent on the care of others, and we know that carers are mostly women. Uh, so this is the work we do at the... This is work we do at the um, UNESCO Chair on Gender at the uh, School of Architecture, School of Architecture of, uh, in Madrid, and we, ha we have uh, um, done many uh, uh, publications on the topic that you could, um, if anybody is particularly interested, these are some, some images of some of our publications. Uh, some of them are available PDF on the internet, uh, so you can just download them. Um, why gender, how gender came into the picture of planning and architecture? This started uh, around 40 years ago. In the late 1970s, uh, several architects and planners, mainly in the US, but also in the UK and in other countries, started to think um, uh, uh, how women were using the, the, the city in different ways. And, and so the analysis um, from <coughs> gender, gender studies uh, provided, uh, sorry, I'm, I can't concentrate while people are speaking. <laughs> 
um, gender studies have provided a number of, um, of terms and concepts that are very relevant for planning and architecture. Uh, the key concept for, for, for this, the design of space and buildings and, and, the, and, and cities <coughs> is the concept of care. A care understood as a paid and mostly unpaid work performed by adult individuals on behalf of children, the old, the sick, and the overall functioning of the household. This is mostly done by women, uh, as we know, uh, and the statistics confirm that the gender gap uh, is not significantly reducing in, uh, in who performs care tasks. And uh, of course, there are all, uh, this is very much related to gender roles, to sexual divisions of labor, to the double workload of women who work inside and outside, and outside the home. Uh, and this implies a very different use of the city. Uh, most of you who are working women, and many of you probably have kids, or maybe some of us already have elderly parents uh, and have had sick relatives. When you work in paid employment and you also have uh, family personal responsibilities in your home, you use the city in very different ways from the way uh, people who don't have care responsibilities have, who are mostly men, and some, uh, because even unmarried women or even single women perform more care tasks than, than, than men and unmarried men. Uh, the Eurostat statistics of time show this. And you have uh, this small scheme shows uh, in, in, in a very schematic and simple way how, and, and our colleague uh, uh, before uh, mentioned it very briefly, by the way, I, I have been working with, with the Vanderlip Foundation in the Urban 95 program, so I know this great, great program very well. Uh, we know that those people who don't have care responsibilities uh, use the city mostly and transportation systems in particular in, with a commuter pattern. They go from their home to the workplace, maybe they do some leisure or sport trip, and they go back home. This is a mostly male pattern of using the city and the transportation system. While for women and those who have uh, care responsibilities, they use the city in far more complex ways because their daily life is far more complicated and complex and unpredictable throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year and throughout the whole of the life. Uh, and so we come in and out to, to, to uh, in paid employment. We, we, some parts of, of our lives we might work part-time because it's impossible to do everything at the same time when if you happen to have two or, two or three, or one or two or three small kids uh, and working full-time, unless you have a lot of help, either by grandparents or, or you can uh, you have enough income to pay someone, it's almost impossible to pay to work full time, really. It's very, very difficult. And depending on where you live, on where your workplace is, on what are the urban facilities that allow the realization of all the tasks to support the life of your family and your own life and, and the household, uh, whether where they are located, whether they are close or they are not close, whether the transport allows you to arrive in time because you need to arrive to those places at particular times of the day, uh, and, and whether how this is compatible with your economic means to pay or not pay for some transportation modes that can be more expensive uh, because they are more flexible, uh, maybe when many families cannot afford two cars. Uh, so it, uh, it can be very, very difficult. And the way cities are structured and the cost of housing and transport can imply that for many people it's not possible to work part-time or it's impossible to accept a promotion or to get a new job in a place that is not easily accessible and compatible to your daily living patterns. So, um, and of course, the way we plan cities has not been thought for, for this way of, for these life requirements. Uh, we plan cities according to techniques that were developed about 100 years ago, at the turn of the 20th century, which are very much in place. They were invented at the, at the turn of the 20th century. They became institutionalized in legal systems. You are, many of you are lawyers after World War II, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, it was very evident, uh, there were very sound reasons to set up these rationalized uh, and ways of, of planning the cities, very sound uh, uh, reasons for, 
organizing, separating users, uh, for uh, laying out the, um, the separation of, of uh, economic activity from living spaces and so on. Uh, because of efficiency, because of the need of, uh, of a quick um, um, uh, increase of the population and, and cities need to, to grow rapidly. Uh, but then the personal experience of those who live the, uh, the city with care responsibilities um, are not really taken into account by, this, by our current planning techniques. Uh, because they are thought for those living the city without care responsibilities, Paid employment is the main focus, is how we solve the needs of the economy, how we solve the needs of, of corporations, of, of the economic production, how we make more efficient uh, the workings of the overall economy. Uh, and, um, and the people who, who take care of, of life uh, have other needs, uh, which sometimes overlap, but some other times get in certain contradictions with the standards way of, uh, uh, that that cities are thought and planned and built and managed. Uh, and the needs of the, and the experiences of those persons who undertake care, care responsibilities are not made explicit. Planners don't, are not aware of this. Many women planners still, uh, I, I have been the, the, about, probably the first person in Spain uh, working on this topic 20 years ago when I created the first uh, urban um, uh, research group in Spanish universities addressing gender and women's topics and they looked at me as if I was mad in my university. <laughs> they, as, if, as if I was crazy. <laughs> Today it's the opposite. But 20 years ago it, I was like, a, like, a, like landed from Mars or something like that. So, um, uh, but we see in, for instance, the field of transportation makes this very clear because it's quantifiable and people understand numbers easily and we see the, the very, very big gender differences in transportation just by looking at the numbers. And we see, for instance, that uh, men travel longer distances, women use many more transportation modes, uh, women have far less access to a private car, but however, mothers of young kids are the one, the one segment of the population that uses mo most the car because with the kind of cities that we have been built, it's impossible to do the many things of daily life of working mothers unless you have a car. It's absolutely impossible because things are so far away and there's no transportation available. You cannot really do this in public transportation, not on foot, so you absolutely need a car. Uh, then the, the number of trips, women do many more trips than men. Uh, the spatial pattern of trips is very different. Men is typically commuting long distance, while women is chain trips in a more polygonal pattern, closer in a smaller geographical area around the home. Um, men don't stop driving until they have a car accident. Uh, that's a joke, but there's a certain truth to it. While for women, when uh, they, they start realizing that they are not so functionally able as they used to be and that there's some danger in driving, they voluntarily uh, stop driving. And then there are is issues of safety, ergonomy, and so on. There's, there has been a lot of research on women and transportation. And I developed this concept um, uh, some years ago for a research project that I did for the Spanish Ministry of Public Works that has been showcased by the European Commission in the Gender Innovations Project and has been applied by the Inter-American Development Bank and by UN Habitat in some cities in the world. It's a concept that allows to make it visible and to quantify uh, the, the, the travel related to care activities, which today is hidden and not counted, and many of those trips are not counted because the, the service, uh, the standard ways that the, the data are, are collected by transportation agencies um, use uh, concepts and categories of analysis when they ask people what, did you, what were your trips yesterday and this is how the statistics are done. They ask for employment, study, shopping, leisure, strolling, escorting visits. This is a very standard set of questions used by transportation agencies around the world. This particular case is from the, the Spanish National Government Survey, but it's very similar in the US or in any other country. And what I, uh, when I did that study, after a while I had finished it and after two months I, 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 some, I got this idea, like 
all these trips that women do, they are really hidden under other headings, under other categories. Many of the shopping you do, not, you, it's not shopping that you do for yourself, like when I buy this, it's uh, shopping that you do for your house, for your kids, for your husband, or for, or for yourself, but for your house, something needed for daily life. No, it's not, it's not uh, leisure shopping. Most of shopping is not leisure shopping. Um, the same with uh, strolling or visiting, uh, escorting is 100%. You escort people who cannot move autonomously on their own in the city, the kids or the elderly who cannot go around by themselves. Uh, so I said, if we say two-thirds of shopping, one-third one of strolling, one-third of visits, and 100% of strollings are trips, and we give it a name, an umbrella concept, we can count it and make it visible. And so I did this supposition, and it came out that the number of trips using the standard, the, the existing survey by the Spanish Ministry of Transport was almost as big as employment-related trips. And then after a while, I convinced one of my students to do her PhD dissertation on this, and we designed a, a survey really with the right questions, looking at the realities of women in their daily responsibilities and their real use of transport for the purposes relating of caring for other persons and of the household. And the, the result was very much to what I had just <coughs> estimated and totally, um, uh, as I said, one third, two thirds, one hundred <laughs> of, of those categories. Uh, uh, this, uh, she did this study for the Madrid population of um, between 30 and 45 years. And uh, this, is, this slide, I'm showing just one, not to confuse you too much, with the sex disaggregated data. And what you see here is that uh, the, the category employment, which for transport engineer is the, the first because it's the biggest, and, so, and, and they design transport systems and they manage them looking at mobility related to employment because of peak hours and because it's the biggest number. But, but when we disaggregate this by sex, we see that uh, men do quite more trips, but not, the, the gap is big, but not so big between men and women as uh, when you look at employment trips. But when you look at care trips, the gender gap is enormous. Men do very, very, very little care trips. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is one reason why transportation engineers and planners do not realize the importance of care-related mobility because they don't live it. That's why it's so important what has been talked about during the day, that there are women in places where, where thought is produced and where policy is made because they bring their own personal experience to the field. I, I also did this small, uh, I'm finished, finishing, this small uh, study for UN Habitat on the mobility of care in Nairobi, uh, which is a city uh, with the Matato users. They have only one uh, system of public transportation, which is privately owned small buses. Uh, and um, uh, uh, transportation is a crazy thing in Nairobi. Uh, trips last uh, from half an hour to an hour, and we found out that women do one additional trip than men on average. And this one additional trip obviously is related to care tasks. And, and then the, the curious thing is that it is as long as the trip related to employment. So this implies, I think, it, it, some more research should be done, but it implies that there are the, the places where care activities ha are done are not close to the, ho to the houses. So they need to do this additional long distance trip, very often involving transfers uh, every day. Uh, so uh, I'm finishing and uh, I invite you to to know the series of conferences that we are organizing every year. We do one or two every year. We call them engendering. And uh, this year, uh, last year we did a, a summer course at the Universidad Internacional Menéndez Pelayo. We will probably we do one more next year. And in June, no, a, a, a beginning of July, we will have a summer school uh, within a European uh, Horizon 2020 project called GE Academy. We will hold it here in Madrid. So if any of you is interested in, in coming, uh, we will be very happy to see you there. Thank you.
Gracias, Inés. Bueno, a mí me ha quedado claro que una ciudad construida por estas tres personas sería ideal, dado que las, los tres puntos de vista eran completamente complementarios. La gestión del residuo, la perspectiva de género y la perspectiva por edades. Así que creo que ya es hora de cerrar. Gracias, Catarina, por organizar este maravilloso panel. Gracias por los, a los asistentes por vuestra paciencia y por la hora. Y hasta mañana.